Well, Palestine has been slowly disappearing from the map since the First World War. This is what it looked like 100 years ago, when Jews only made up 3% of the population. That picture has now changed dramatically. Palestinians are now only allowed limited self-rule in small pockets under Israeli military occupation, which is the longest in modern history. Let's get more on this. Joining us on the news hour, Phyllis Bennis is a fellow with the Institute for Policy Studies and author of the book Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict. She joins us out of Washington. Phyllis Bennis, the Palestinians want not just a statement, but a strongly worded statement from the US. And Security Council, will they get it? I don't think it's likely that there will be even a presidential statement because the United States will not allow that to happen. Uh, the problem is that asking only for a statement isn't going to accomplish very much. It's not going to change the situation on the ground. The notion of a United Nations independent investigation, of course, is very important, but there needs to be something more than that. There needs to be condemnation, there needs to be a recognition that these actions by Israel, and remember, days before this uh, set of protests began, today was only the first day of what is anticipated to be a six-week long nonviolent protest. Camps had been set up, tents were put up, playing fields for children had been established, uh, and the Israeli response days ago was, we are sending 100 snipers who will be prepared to use force. Uh, if people approach the fence. Now, given the size of the Gaza Strip and the fact that the Israeli fence surrounds the entire Strip, the notion of approaching the fence means breathing inside Gaza. So the notion that simply asking for a stronger statement is simply not going to be enough. I don't think they will get even that because the United States almost certainly uh, will refuse to, to join in anything that does not uh, privilege Israel and does not ignore the questions of the violations of international humanitarian law and violations of the Geneva Conventions. A number of ambassadors tonight, the Swedish ambassador, the French ambassador, others, spoke of the need for uh, all actions to be proportionate, that there, there should not be this kind of disproportionate use of force. The, the Swedish ambassador even said, it appears that all the children who were among the, the dead and injured uh, we're all Palestinians, as if that was somehow surprising when you're talking about an unarmed Palestinian protest, uh, where eventually a few children picked up stones, stones against tanks. The first casualty this morning was a farmer on his own land who was killed by a tank shell when the Israelis had brought a tank right up to the fence. This is not something where you talk about balance, something that the Palestinian ambassador referenced. So I don't think we're likely to see a strong statement and unfortunately, I don't think we're likely to see, at this stage at least, any real action by the United Nations. And what's your reading of the, the stance very strongly taken on the part of Israel? Because their line is there, there were Hamas people woven through that, that tapestry of humanity that we saw taking part in what started out as a peaceful protest. That peaceful protest remained a peaceful protest on the Palestinian side. Were there members of the Hamas political party? Probably. It's the largest party in Gaza. They won the elections in 2006. So were there supporters of Hamas? Probably, yes. The protest was not called by Hamas. The protest was called by a collaboration of civil society organizations and was endorsed by all of the political parties, half a dozen or more parties within Gaza. They all endorsed it, including Hamas, of course. But the notion that somehow by saying there were Hamas people there is designed to discredit uh, this extraordinary outpouring of people who were not only commemorating Land Day, but also, as you, one of your packages indicated earlier, this was all about the right of return. With the abandonment of a two-state solution, partly by the fact that Israeli settlement has made it impossible, and partly because Donald Trump and others have made clear that it is not their goal, Palestinians, particularly in Gaza this week, are looking at fundamentals, and the fundamentals include the right of return guaranteed in UN Resolution 194, something that the Israelis have never implemented, have never allowed the Palestinians to return despite that resolution. So this time around, they were saying this is a march for return, and it's to put on the agenda of the world this right that has been denied now for 70 years. Phyllis Bannis there in Washington. Thank you so much.